And with that, I'd like to introduce Susan Gilliland, who hopefully has something prepared for tonight. Well, I don't have any jokes. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your patience, everyone, with all those terrible jokes. Uh, welcome to the Los Angeles Birders. We're very pleased to welcome back John Dunn and Kimball Garrett. Kimball and John are no strangers to you or to lab webinars, and we thank them very much for their generosity and for their patience with all the jokes for providing these informative meetings. John and Kimball have been friends since childhood, and together they've authored several books, including The Birds of Southern California, Status and Distribution, The Field Guide to Warblers, and The Birds of the Los Angeles Region. John currently serves on the American Ornithological Society and is on the North American Classification Committee, which is responsible for evaluating and organizing the latest scientific developments in the classification, nomenclature, and distribution of North and Middle American birds. This committee produces the official checklist of North American birds. So without further ado, let's dive right into the often perplexing world of taxonomy and classification, take our lumps and our splits, and we are sure that our understanding of taxonomy and classification will be a little less muddled by the end of the night with our great speakers to guide us through this process. So please welcome John Dunn and Kimball Garrett. Good evening, hi folks. Thanks for uh, sitting in on a cool night. Um, I thought we have a, we'd give a little bit of an introduction of ourselves with the AOS and the North American Checklist Committee. And we have a little sample at the bottom of motions from last year, the first A batch to keep you humored. Well, uh, no more jokes, uh, but uh, we'll carry on to the next image. So my involvement with the NACC was I believe it was Van Remsen in the mid nineties sent me half of the draft of the seventh edition of the checklist to review it for distributional, a distributional overview. Uh, I got through only half of it and had 40 typewritten pages, single spaced of changes that needed to be made and ran out of time because I needed to go to Thailand. And a few years later, Dick Banks, the chairman, asked if I would um, be willing to be a member of the committee as their distributional expert. He couldn't make up his mind whether I should vote, but he said, go, go ahead and start voting and we'll think about whether we count your votes or not, which was fine. The um, net result is I joined in 2000 and I'm still on the uh, NACC committee. Um, Kimball, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so hi everybody. Um, and before we go any further, we have a brief acknowledgement slide at the end, but I, I really want to acknowledge Susan and Frank Gilliland who helped put these presentations together. We could not have done it without them. So thanks very much to them. So my involvement with the NACC is, is really simply as a user of their products. Um, I'm one of their constituents as really are all of you as birders. So, you know, whether it's a, a publication I'm working on, a checklist I'm trying to come up with, maintaining the official LA County list, uh, involvement um, in the past uh, with the California Bird Records Committee and the California list, um, books and so on and also as a museum person organizing collections and, and data, uh, we all need a taxonomic authority. So I'm really one of the people that the NACC is doing all that work for, but again, the point is so are all of you. So tonight we wanna just demystify some of the process. So in the next slide. Um, so again, it goes without saying that I think all birders are infatuated with the, the species level taxonomy and with lists of species, checklists, you know, the sequences and field guides and all that. So we need a standard. We can't just have random lists of birds thrown together. And so for North America, this has long been what was the American Ornithologist Union, which is recently renamed as the American Ornithological Society after its merger with the Cooper Ornithological Society. 
and it's their checklist of North American birds. And we'll go through a little bit of the history of that later. So, you know, we know that taxonomy ought to be stable, but we also as birders know that of course it's not, things change all the time. And so what we really wanna do again is kind of demystify how some of these changes come about. Um, the changes can be in English names, sequences, scientific names. And in fact, as we've seen, the name of the organization has changed. The name of the journal we will soon see has changed from the AUK to ornithology. And so everything changes all the time. Um, next slide. So once again, the taxonomy of North American birds has been basically the purview of the AOU, now the AOS's Committee on Classification and Nomenclature. Uh, this is often abbreviated or considered the North American Classification Committee because there is a South American one. And so we often just go by the abbreviation NACC and that stands for North American Classification Committee. Next. So you'll, you'll sort of hear some themes off and on tonight, one of which, of course, is nomenclatural stability. Um, there is actually a code, an international code of zoological nomenclature, which sort of governs the uh, formation and the stability of scientific names. And um, basically, they are preserved. Once you give something a name, that stays unless there's a reason to change it. And uh, the oldest name has priority. And... This is a really important, we can't just have names changing willy nilly all the time. So it's really important that this is codified. Um, classifications are meant of course to reflect relationships and um, increasingly over the last you know, 100 years and especially in recent decades, um, these classifications are tweaked to more accurately reflect true evolutionary or phylogenetic relationships. And so that's one of the reasons we see changes so often. Um, you're all aware of the, sort of the hierarchy of uh, classification levels uh, within birds. There are, are 30 to 40 orders, depending on who you talk to. These divided into families, subfamilies, and then genera, which is the plural of genus. Species and many species are divided into subspecies. So again, if there is a species um, that is not um, considered to be varying in terms of named subspecies and it's considered monotypic. There are no subspecies. But once a subspecies is described, and this is a polytypic species, um, the nominate subspecies is the one uh, that the species was described and based on, and that gets a trinomial. Uh, again, the genus and species names form the binomial or scientific name. The trinomial applies to subspecies uh, the nominate subspecies, the third name would be the same as the second, the same as the specific epithet. Um, and then other subspecies would have different names. Um, so we'll be talking about sort of that nexus between the species and subspecies level because that's where a lot of the debates and the changes are. Um, but the binomial, the, the two word scientific name of a species is really the currency of, of taxonomy. Next. Uh, we put these up before, and again, as Mark said, they're on the website, but I really, and we both encourage all of you to spend some time with both of these websites because they not only have all the current checklists that are official and up to date, but they are very open and upfront about the proposals and for changes. And so these are listed. And in fact, once the proposals are voted upon and adjudicated, the votes are actually posted online and you can read what the reasoning is behind the changes or the failure to accept the changes. And uh, these are just extremely informative sites. And the South American site has a tremendous number of references. They've got all of the past proposals and current proposals there. So there's just a wealth of information there. We really encourage you to spend some time with these websites. Next. So, so John. Right, hi folks again. So the first thing we note about the NACC membership of the committee for over a hundred years, it was represented by white males. Um, it wasn't until uh, Carla and Pam 
uh, that came on the committee uh, around 2000 that, that became at least non-male. We've also made an outreach to get, because the um, North American checklist extends down through Panama to have a Hispanic representation uh, representing uh, their viewpoints to the south of the United States. The members of the committee are professional ornithologists. Um, I would add all of them with PhDs in ornithology, it's usually from the faculties of university of universities. Uh, I'm an exception. I do have a degree in political science with a minor in history, which I'm not sure quite the relevance of that is, but of course, I'm a keen birder. In any case, I was brought on for the distributional uh, reviewing status and distribution. The it, committee is chaired by Terry uh, Chesser out of the Smithsonian uh, and Carla out of Berkeley. And it, you can see the current membership down below. Let's go to the next image. The committee was formed soon after the creation of what was then the American Ornithologist Union in uh, 1883. And they composed a committee, got a committee together. And the first edition of the checklist was in 1886. And you can see the various editions of the checklist. Uh, the last one which was published was now 22 years ago. Um, beginning in 1982, the sixth, they extended their coverage down through Panama, included the West Indies, Bermuda, and uh, also Hawaii was added. Uh, Greenland was included up through the fifth edition in 1957, and then dropped in the sixth and the seventh, but has now been restored. So Greenland is part of North America. Uh, as is Bermuda has always been part of North America. In addition, uh, supplements are published, um, typically for many years on a biannual basis. Since a little after 2000, they now come out on an annual basis. Um, but uh, it's been, and that's now a, a given. Um, and we'll go to the, and they're published by the way, the published, typically in July, it used to be the July issue and, and still is, but the information is put out online, oh, by mid to late June for the changes for the, so the motions we will soon be voting on, the results of those will be published in about oh, seven months, seven, eight months. The 1973 supplement, and we'll touch on this. That was really the first I was aware of uh, NACC taxonomy, but it was um, strictly aware of, of losing a whole bunch of birds from lumps and learning of two things I'd barely ever heard of, the Thayer's gull and the alder flycatcher, and certainly knew very little to almost nothing about identifying uh, these taxa, although I was in school in Northern Illinois at the time. The next image. So here's the Thayer skull. Uh, Larry's shot of an adult. We, this is not a gull class, but you can look on the underside of P10 on the close front figure and see extensive white. Uh, it is now an Iceland gull. There were, um, it's important to comment that there were no published supplements between 1956 and 1973. 57 was when the fifth edition of the checklist came out. And you could very easily make a case that had there been annual supplements, Thayer's gull would have been moved from herring gull into Iceland gull based on the recommendations that were published by McPherson in 1961. 
Uh, and he made a very strong case for that happening. But after McPherson, another graduate student, well, I'm not sure what McPherson's status was, but uh, Neil Smith came along from Cornell and did three years of gull work in the high Arctic and stated that Theri was a fully good species and published. And on that basis, it was um, determined to be a full species by the NACC in 73. Now, since then, attempts to replicate Smith's work were unsuccessful in many regards. And the entire veracity of Smith's work was questioned in print. And basically, the NACC made a decision to go back to the recommendation of McPherson in 1961. So some of these, it's cold case files. Um, I can't quite say it was a crime that was committed, but you really have to go back and uh, carefully track what happened and when. Next image. So just in case you're still inspired by Thera's gull, we thought we'd put in a, a worn second year bird or a bird not quite a year old, when really all birds of that age and in that state of wear, I don't encourage you to spend time on them. The main thing about the 73 supplement were the number of birds that got lumped, a dozen or more. And I know this because I had proudly gotten over 600, which was considered the big step to take as an aspiring birder. And when I looked at the supplement, when I got my, I think it was published in uh, North American Birds at the time, it was worse than the last day of October in 1929, or with the 29th, was it Black Thursday? My list crashed. And all these birds, which I had chased, had been merged. Now, some of them, like Blue Goose, just a color morph, but Ipswich Sparrow, there's a long list, Myrtle and Audubon's Warbler, many of which have since been uh, re split. It sort of represented a species concept at the time, uh, perhaps championed by Ernst Meyer, who had a huge uh, influence on taxonomy the biological species concept. So we'll go on to the next page. So what the decisions that the NACC makes are based on motions. The motions can be uh, written by a committee member and often are, and each committee member is responsible for a particular group of families. Uh, I'm again responsible for the distribution, but motions can be made by anyone and often are now and encouraged. They're circulated to Terry, who reads them over, makes corrections, puts them in a batch, and typically during the course of the year, we'll review three, four, five uh, sets of motions. Some are rather large, some are small. We vote, we send our votes to the rest of the committee uh, who may change their votes. So this is not um, hanging chads or uh, you read the comments of someone else and, and often votes do change. But in the end, it takes two thirds of the membership to affirmatively endorse a change in the status quo. So if a species is lumped, it takes two thirds to, um, to reach that or if a species is split the same. Keep in mind, this is a slightly looser standard than rarities committees determining identification, where it's usually unanimous minus one or at most two dissenting votes. Sometimes, usually the chair doesn't vote unless it's a tie and his vote is important or he feels very strongly on an issue. So that pretty well states what I, by the end of, oh, by the, the end of March, the, the decisions are pretty well made and uh, the manuscript is submitted during April 
after it's reviewed many times and it uh, gets appears then in June uh, on the internet. And it motion starts circulating right about now. In fact, we have our first batch. And their um, next image. So once the motions are compiled, they're put online. So the members or the, the public can look at what we're considering each batch at a time. Obviously the committee members see them before the public does. And eventually after the, the uh, supplement is published, the actual member comments go online. Uh, this is a bit of a mixed blessing now as I'll detail a little later, um, but they're not attributable to name, which might be a good thing. Um, keep in mind that even if a motion doesn't pass, usually at the end of the supplement, they will mention the issues that were considered in addition to what we publish. And those motions will remain online and they often stimulate a uh, further research and another paper and will cause the committee to relook at a particular issue, usually for splitting something. And keep in mind that splits are far more frequent than lumps. Next image. The South American Checklist Committee does much of the same thing that the North American Checklist Committee does, except they have many more species. And uh, I would say the taxonomy down there is certainly more complicated with all the geographical barriers, separation and whatnot. There is close coordination between the two, two committees. Uh, Van Remsen, I believe is the chair for the SACC is also a member the NACC, and when we have a pertinent issue that uh, for North America, which is based on an SACC action, we, we see the what the vote was with the SACC and see the members' comments as well as the motion that precipitated the change and typically get a recommendation from one of their members. I believe Doug Stotts is also on both committees. Kevin Zimmer, whom you know, uh, up in the Morro Bay area. I think Atascadero is on the South American Checklist Committee. And once again, they, they work very closely together on uh, taxonomic issues. Next image. Now new records to the distributional area in North America. Uh, they are vetted if it's in the US or Canada, they'll typically first be reviewed by a state or provincial committee. Nearly all states and provinces have their own committee. And then that if they're passed, typically then the ABA checklist committee reviews them. If they accept the records on identification and or origin, uh, then it's published in the issue of birding the, it's the November or December issue, the last issue of the year of birding. And then that's, that's a trigger to write a motion for the uh, AOS. And the majority, most of the committee typically endorses action taken by the ABA, whether it's identification and origin. Now the ABA, uh, and this is in a bylaw that we adopted, uh, is re basically required to follow the AOS on taxonomy and nomenclature. There are very few instances where the ABA and the AOS differ on particular records. I think there may be two, but the one that comes immediately to mind is the Azure Gallinol, the juvenile from upstate New York, or maybe it was the New York City region. The AOS accepted and initially did the ABA then their thoughts that it might have escaped from an agriculturist in the area. The ABA reconsidered and removed it. The AOS decided to stick with the record on a split vote. Keep in mind, it would require, I think it was an even vote with AOS, but it would require two thirds to overturn the earlier decision. 
and also nomenclature. The English names is within the provision of the NACC. Next image. So <coughs> you might recognize the image on the right, formerly named after a major general of the Confederacy and now named Thick Build Longspur, which refers to the prefix of the genus Rink. Uh, this is a newly restored genus. It's uh, genetically sort of intermediate between the Snow and McKay's bunting and the other long spurs. So it was put back into uh, Rinkophanes, which is what it was when I first started birding, then was merged into Calcareous. Uh, the life of McCown was examined in great detail. He made major ornithological contributions during his time in, with the U.S. Army in South Texas uh, in the before and after the Mexican-American War. He stayed with the U.S. Army. In 1861, he left his post for the Confederacy was eventually promoted to a major general. There was a motion a couple of years ago because of his association with the Confederacy to remove the English name. It did not pass. It was submitted again. And after a lot of um, debate, it was decided to drop McCown. And then we had to figure out, well, what do we call it? Uh, short grass long spur was the other popular candidate, maybe buffalo long spur, bay wing long spur, but we settled on the thick build long spur. Uh, it was one that was close and Terry voted. So um, often the, the names require, the English names elucidate the greatest debates or the most uh, heated. And this carried on with the public world as well. Uh, English names is a, a very important issue and probably more important to the birding public. What do we call our birds? When I take a long drive on a tour, I sometimes get the group to think about the, what birds we call, the birds in the US that we call tanagers, which are five, are not tanagers. So they're not in theropody, they're in the family cardinality. And the five species that have been recorded in the US it, that are in the tanager family are not called tanagers. So then I have them guess, can you think of those species? And if it's a three hour drive, usually by the end of that, they've come up with the answers with lots of hints. It makes the, the miles go by a little more uh, easily. The thick billed long spur is an excellent name, by the way, it really does have a thick bill. So the committee believes in nomenclatural stability. We readily acknowledge that some English names may be confusing at best, or you can't see the field mark, the ring neck duck. There was a proposal a year or two ago to call it ring billed duck. Uh, but there's a long history with ringneck duck and the scientific name is Ithia cholerus, referring again to the ring. Green heron, how many times have I heard that uh, I can't see any green on that bird, but there are many others and we uh, live with them. There is no perfect English name, but each has a long history usually. Uh, the one time we do have to find new names, typically not always, but when we split a species, we often try to find new English names for both of the split species. Next image, Kimball. Okay, well, let me get into some of the weeds here. Uh, actually, before I do that, I just wanna emphasize one thing John might've mentioned, but it's worth emphasizing that Changing the English name of McCown's Longspur to Thickbuild is a decision the AOS can make, but they can't excise or, or get rid of the name McCowni in the specific epithet of that species name. That's preserved under the rules of zoological nomenclature. 
So even when you're successful in, in um, deleting somebody's recognition in an English name, it's going to remain in the scientific name. The other thing I'll mention is John didn't answer what the five. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead and tell them the seed eater story, which is one of the five, how the scientific and English names are spelled differently, which proves the point as well and gives them one of the five. Yeah, I was going to say at the very end of this uh, evening, maybe uh, in the Q&A, we can, you can think about what the five true tanagers in the ABA checklist are. John's already given you a hint on one. Um, referring to Moralet or Moralet, why it's spelled differently in the English name than in the scientific name. We'll get back to that, I think, later. <coughs> so anyway, AOS obviously has to make a lot of decisions, not only at species level, but other hierarchical groupings and taxonomy, and also to put a, an evolutionary tree into a linear sequence. And so you don't just do that randomly, you actually have to come up with some conventions and algorithms for uh, determining how you kind of compress a phylogenetic tree or tree of evolutionary relationships into a linear sequence. And so all of these processes have been refined and I think codified and, and um, thought about a lot more carefully in, in recent decades. So things like um, where do you draw the line at families and orders and things like that? And you want to maintain some consistency in the evolutionary age of the different levels of the hierarchy um, that orders would have split roughly the same time evolutionarily, families more recently, genera more recently, and so on. Um, anyway, and that's based, as we've said, on published, <coughs> published studies. So. Um, the NACC very explicitly adheres to the biological species concept. And in fact, to be a member of the NACC, you really have to agree to uh, adhere to that. So there are other species concepts, but basically you probably hear a lot about the phylogenetic species concept. This is not concept adopted by the NACC. Um, that's based strictly on diagnosability and really the the true biology of what goes on in the field with things like reproductive isolation, hybridization, and so on are not even considered. Um, the biological species concept takes into account, um, for example, uh, things like reproductive isolation, whether it's provable in the field because the taxa are allopatric and occur, meaning their ranges overlap, or parapatric, their ranges abut one another, uh, but a little more difficult to apply when the species are, uh, excuse me, sympatric when they occur together. I used the wrong term. It's a little more difficult when they're allopatric, meaning they occur in different non-overlapping areas. How do you put a test of hybridization uh, there? And so then you have to kind of come up with some ways of putting weight on differences on, in behavior, vocalizations, uh, things that might be important in reproductive isolation were they to occur with one another. So anyway, the, just the point is that I think the NACC and taxonomic um, uh, committees like that are, are, are being, they're putting a lot more weight on all of these things and they're looking at them very carefully when they come up with their decisions. So next slide. So we already talked about how even applying the biological species concept has varied over time. So John talked about the big lump in 1973 when so many hybridizing taxa were lumped together. And that was just sort of in vogue at that time. If there were extensive hybrid zones, uh, the species or the taxa formerly considered full species were lumped together. We've since been able to look at some of these hybrid zones more carefully, look at their trends over time and their extent. And of course, look at these things genetically uh, with molecular data. And very often what happens is it turns out the hybridizing taxa are not even taxa or taxonomic groups, in this case, formerly considered species, are not even each other's closest relatives. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about Baltimore and Bullock's orioles later on. Turns out they are not even sister species or they're each other's closest relatives. So uh, that big lump of 1973 was largely, in, in many ways, 
reversed by about 1998 when they, the latest edition of the checklist was published. Um, again, looking not only at, well, all sorts of molecular data, uh, phenotypic data, but also incorporating vocal and other behavioral information in addition to the kinds of morphological differences which had been so important for so long. So in other words, just the kinds of data that enter into the picture have increased over time and all, all of them are very important in making these kinds of decisions. Next slide. <coughs> and of course, as you well know, there's just been an explosion of molecular studies looking at the genetics of birds from the population level on up to the uh, major uh, groupings of, of birds and the early evolution of birds. And you know what I like to call a forest of phylogenetic trees are published every year. And this started out fairly crudely. Uh, you go back into the 70s and it was protein electrophoresis. Um, then of course the Sibley's DNA, DNA hybridization work. These were all groundbreaking and they really uh, informed us a great deal, but they're quite primitive compared to what can be done nowadays when in fact entire genomes can be sequenced. So there's no shortage of genetic data. It's a question of how do you deal with all that information. And for example, what, what part of the genome do you want to look at? And this really depends on what kind of um, divergence you're looking at. Are you looking right down at the population level or the species, subspecies level? Or are you looking, for example, at the major groupings of modern birds from the neo aves to other groups and so on? And so you might look at different parts of the genome to answer these different questions, but the possibilities now are almost endless. It's just a question of how do you deal with this incredible explosion of data. Next. So here's a tree. Don't worry about the specifics. Um, in fact, I didn't even give a citation for this. These happen to be Orioles, but this is a typical phylogenetic tree that could be generated with molecular data. And you will notice, for example, if you can see this close enough at the top, uh, Icterus cayenensis is an Oriole. Um, if you look at cayenensis, it actually has got something else right in the middle of it. So this, this is paraphyletic. In other words, the species doesn't group together as a group. There's somebody else that's an intruder in there, which is a hint that something's wrong with the current, um, at least based on these data, with the current taxonomic uh, species level taxonomy. And you can see this occurring in several places here. Um, and basically the short, the node is, a, is where the tree branches and the, the shorter the nodes, of course, are more recent divergence. So you can see within subspecies, within a species, the node is, is very short. And then you've got very long nodes which separate major groupings of orioles. But one of the points here is you'll notice numbers here at each node. Uh, there's this different ways of doing this statistically, but the larger bottom number is called the bootstrap value. And essentially it's just a statistical technique that says if you resample all the data a hundred times, how many times are you gonna come up with the same result? A um, hundred is a great bootstrap value. It means you can be really confident there. So it's, it's kind of like if the voters in Pennsylvania go to the polls a hundred times and um, Biden wins, 98 times, that's a bootstrap of 98. That's a very high value. Um, somebody else might have a lower bootstrap value, but um, you can see the numbers generally, if they're up in the 90s to 100, those are really good bootstrap values. Anything over 70 is at least pretty suggestive. Once you start getting down toward 50, you can't have a lot of confidence in those nodes. But um, I am the last person to even begin to explain the statistical massaging that has to go into creating these things and interpreting them. But believe me, there are taxonomists and systematists um, who make careers of this and they really know how to crunch these data. But again, whenever you look at a tree like this, you wanna make sure that you can be pretty confident in that the nodes are real and this bootstrap value is one statistical method of giving you that confidence. So the next slide, Going back to, again, molecular systematics. Um, 
the ideal thing, of course, is to take all these molecular data and put them into what we might call a total evidence taxonomic decision-making strategy. So you include other data sets as well. Um, of course, the standard like morphological differences, plumage, structure, size, all of that. But vocalizations, behaviors, ecological niches, and of course, factoring in what we know from the fossil record when we do have a record. So um, again, this is sort of important for the biological species concept of, to look at, at behavior, reproductive isolation, to actually do field work, uh, whereas other species concepts might simply rely on being able to diagnose differences uh, without in, including all these other biological data. So it's a lot of work. Um, I, uh, you look at the methodology sections of a lot of these taxonomic papers nowadays and it's, it's mind numbing, um, but believe me, there are a lot of people who are really good at it. There's just great information coming out all the time. Next. Was I doing? So, I, I, yeah, this is one where we can't decide who's going to do this, but I can think, uh, can I let me you? just point out, John, no, you can't. Let me just point out <laughs> quickly before then, then I'll stop. But the second and third bullet points here are actually verbatim text from the um, uh, latest edition of the AOU, or, or excuse me, from the AOS website. So that's text verbatim. But John will certainly want to weigh in on some of this. So go ahead. No, Kimball, I was just going to back you up. Two things occurred to me as you were talking. Um, you know, in addition to making species or non species decision, a lot of the changes is involve the linear sequence within a family and then higher level systematics. And Kimball, do you just want to add a few words on that? You know, for instance, the loons that in our Birds of Southern California in 1981, we have in the middle of the book, uh, they always of course started the linear sequence of our birds and now they've finally gotten to the sort of the middle of the book. Uh, but at higher level systematics and linear sequence, uh, for instance, some of the species within Calidris have only recently been put there. They're in a monotypic genus previously. So it's more than just, species uh, species or, or not a species. And I'm happy to let you carry on. I just thought one more thing to add about uh, there's more than we discussed. Yeah, well, again, th thanks for pointing that out because of course the genetic work has, has resulted in a lot of rearrangements of uh, at the higher levels. I mean, so for example, prior to genetic work, who would have guessed that flamingos and grebes are each other's closest relatives? And yet that's become very clear from genetic work. Um, and some other things that in, in retrospect don't seem that surprising, even though they'd never really been considered before, like the kagu from New Caledonia being closely related to the sun bitterns of the New World tropics and things like that. So they're, um, you know, or, or conversely, uh, the falconiformes, which we always learned long ago is including uh, falcons, hawks, eagles, new world vultures, uh, all these birds of prey type things, that it turns out that the falconidae or the true falcons are um, only rather distantly related to the hawks and eagles and the accipitriformes, um, with the cathartiformes or the new world vultures being sort of a sister group to the accipitriformes. So all these things have been um, informed by genetic data. And then just one, this is kind of getting into taxonomic sausage making, but one quick comment on sequences is sometimes uh, sequences don't make a lot of sense to us. So, so for example, the expanded colidris or the expanded genus Cetophaga and the wood warblers and things. But again, it's based on genetic relatedness and then also on the algorithms for when you have a tree, how do you turn that into a linear sequence? And there's actually conventions for um, at a particular node in the tree, you would rotate it so the node with the fewest species is listed first in the sequence before the node with more species uh, in that node and so on. So there are some conventions for doing it. It isn't just random, but um, 
yeah, the higher level taxonomy, the explosion of new orders, the rearrangement of things between orders, or in the case of the tanagers between families and so on, has been a really interesting result of this uh, genetic explosion to genetic work. And, uh, but right now we're going to go down to the lower level and look at, at subspecies. There's um, kind of this thought that the NACC really doesn't care about subspecies because they haven't dealt with them since the 1957 checklist, but they do care very much. It's basically a series of practical decisions that have kept them from publishing at the subspecies level. So John, you want to take over and expand on that? Well, just, just briefly, the um, so we covered subspecies up through 57. The 1931 checklist, if you can find it, I, that would be the fourth edition of the checklist, gives English names for all of the subspecies uh, that were decided at least at that time. And sometimes we consider those when something gets upgraded to a species as a possible English name. But by the sixth edition, uh, we, in addition to the United States and Canada and in, in Greenland, we included all of Middle America down through Panama, as well as the West Indies and Hawaii. So it, the species list greatly expanded and to prepare all the accounts they just dropped uh, covering subspecies. And that happened again in the seventh. There's a real desire, but then the definitions, what is a subspecies? Um, it's kind of, oh, maybe like a, a species where, uh, but that Supreme Court justice uh, said, I know it when I see it sometimes. But um, there's the, uh, Amadon came up with a 75% rule as one suggestion where within a geographical area, 75% of a particular birds and uh, of a species in that area should differ by 100% of a, the adjacent subspecies. So that's one guideline. Some would prefer a higher level than 90 to 95% of the individuals in that area. But really, if we decided to include subspecies, you'd have to do a full overhaul of the entire checklist of polytypic species and decide what's valid typically size races, that's not considered a valid enough distinction for subspecific definition. Uh, in the case of the juniper titmice, there's some genetic differences with no morphological differences. Do you recognize that? Most would say no. So it's really gonna require a lot of care and it's hard enough for everybody. A lot of the members of the committee have jobs to consider a full overview of all polytypic species and what to recognize and what not. Michael Patton went through the song sparrows and the number of uh, subspecies that were recognized was reduced at least by a third. Uh, and that could probably take place with some other species too. Oh, a horned lark with close to 50 recognized subspecies seems a bit excessive, doesn't it? But I haven't looked at that very carefully. We did fill up a page in the geographic guide of horned lark subspecies. Carp probably could have filled a book with them. Um, at times we're asked, a couple of times since I've been on the committee, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has asked us to weigh in on uh, subspecies issues. Uh, what I remember best was whether to recognize the goshawk in um, northern goshawk from the southwest mountains basically Southeast Arizona and Mexico. Apache, I believe it's a little darker. It is larger and the decision was to recognize it and that carries uh, conservation issues. Uh, Bob Zink published a paper saying that the willow flycatcher should be monotypic. Subspecies extimus should not be recognized and yet alone, um, the vocalizations, the a song, I would guess, the Fitzview is differs, and maybe some of the other notes between Extimus and, and the others, which would imply it probably does have a, a valid basis um, for, for recognition. So anyway, lots of things going on. Why don't we carry on and uh, do some case histories? So 
the Baltimore Bullock Soriel that was based on hybridization in the Great Plains, which has since shifted west. Uh, the, there were plenty of peer birds within the zone and basically using the same criteria was decided to re-split them and since shown that they weren't even sister species. The uh, Baltimore Orioles did not change their caps and uniforms. Um, so um, that was that. We didn't do it to accommodate the Baltimore Orioles team. Next, uh, let's carry on. So here's just a glance through. I put in a few we're gonna, and we really wanted, it's just a sample of some of the issues involved that I found interesting and I'll give a few buzzwords on them, but we want to allow a lot of time for your own questions about lumps and splits and issues. So let's see how quickly I can get through these without getting bogged down. We'll hit the next slide. Uh, Kimball found this junco out in Palmdale a few days ago, which may be the first acceptable record of uh, Dorsalis, the redback junco, which breeds basically Flagstaff, the Mogollon Rim to the Guadalupe Mountains of West Texas. That's closest lookalike is Caniceps, the next subspecies to the north and more migratory with a different bill color. It's a little paler underneath, particularly on the throat. Uh, the bill is bigger, by the way. Look at though the uh, scapulars. I was looking at the scapulars and they're reddish as is the yellow-eyed junco, which is genetically closer, at least in one study. Dorsalis is genetically closer to the yellow-eyed junco than the caniceps. Uh, the gray-headed, the, the bird from the Central Rockies. And at least the ones I heard in the Guadalupe Mountains of Dorsalis, they sang like yellow-eyed juncos and came into tapes of yellow-eyed juncos. I threw in this pink-sided, the pink-sided junco is reported all in many often and misidentified because most of the illustrations and field guides do not show a pink-sided junco. Uh, this is Mern's eye, this is a nice one that Larry got. Look how that, that pink mauve color comes way out into the middle of the underparts and has a uh, pale gray head, kind of like a caniceps. So that's not directly relevant, except that few people get pink-sided juncos right, which is a pretty scarce bird in California. So maybe the dorsalis is a dark-eyed, yellow-eyed junco. Mallards and Mexican ducks. Well, we re-split the Mexican duck in large part because the genetic basis, looking at the genetics, if you do not recognize Mexican duck, then you better lump model duck and American black duck and Hawaiian duck. So you lump them all or you split them all and they all were split and so is now the Mexican duck in the lower left. Uh, most people know what a male mallard looks like. The others, the females and males look quite similar. Next image. So this was at Furnace Creek Ranch on had Christmas dinner at the inn with my uh, brother and his wife. And we went down to the sewage ponds and here's what looked like a Mexican duck. And it's a male with a greenish bill. You can see the darker color, uh, the body and the, the rufus is, or the paler markings, they're a little more rufescent, a little darker than the hen mallard that's in the front. The tail's a little wider on the mallard. Next image. White-fronted geese, it's just there's a juve in the middle. Uh, our subspecies, uh, Dick Banks named Sponza, uh, which is a, one of the smaller subspecies. Uh, next. And here's one up close. Notice the neck color and a pretty stubby bill. Next image. There's a very distinct taxon with a longer, sort of a slightly different colored bill. Uh, notice how much darker the neck is, often a thicker neck. Uh, this bird breeds south of Mount Denali between there and Cook Inlet and winters in the Western Sacramento Valley. Uh, Calusa is the best place to see it. This is Algasi, the Thule goose, uh, and genetically rather distinct. The best field mark could be the blue collar, 
but not all birds have them. Next image. So these are algaci, the tule geese. Uh, the upper right image, well, of course, there's a coot there. Uh, there's one white fronted there in the upper right, uh, sponsa with algaci. And the bottom bird, or all algaci, the big males get very thick legs of algaci. So my suspicion is this and maybe the Greenland bird, Flavorostris, could be distinct species. This is kind of potpourri of various issues. There's no theme to this particularly, except things that interest me and Kimball, hopefully. Next image. Well, the saga of the, the bean geese. They were formerly known as bean geese and probably should continue to be known as bean geese. They got split into tundra and taiga. This is the one that turned up at the Salton Sea and was argued about extensively and endlessly, and finally decided that we'd accept it as a tundra slash uh, taiga bean goose. The coloration and bill shape is closer to, certainly closer to taiga. Uh, the overall size closer to tundra. Um, and recent, a recent genetic paper that came out said they should be relumped. I'm all in favor of it. Next image, there is a real taiga bean goose. This is the split from um, Leech's storm petrel, the Townsend storm petrel, smaller and darker with a pure white rump that breeds on islets off Guadalupe Island. They're dark rumped and white rump birds. The dark rumps, dark rump birds we don't uh, obviously recognize, uh, but these are seen off Southern California in small numbers. And um, there's also off Guadalupe Island, Ainley storm petrel, which has not been recorded. Breeds, I think it breeds in the winter down there. This is a summer breeder, but maybe I've reversed them. Um, yeah, Ainley's is unknown for California. Splits from Leech's storm petrel. Next image. The Western flycatchers, Cordillera and Pacific Slope was a split a good while ago, but Arch McCollum and others have found that a good portion of the West has intermediate uh, birds. When you hear them in Southeast Arizona, they sound distinctive. Uh, the ones in the uh, Warner Mountains and probably the Eastern Sierra are sort of in that intermediate zone. And it would be a relief to all if they got, or many of us, if they got lumped. Next. <coughs> scrub jays. Uh, initial split, split the island scrub jay and the Florida scrub jay. And then we had Western scrub jay, but the genetic studies indicated that the Woodhouse, uh, Woodhouse's jay and the California scrub jay were genetically more different than California scrub jay and the island scrub jay. Um, the two come into contact and seem to hybridize pretty frequently about where 395 meets the Nevada border at Topaz Lake. I'll just comment that all of the scrub jays in Alpine County and Northeastern California are not Woodhouse's scrub jays, they're California scrub jays. Yet eBird reports are full of, you seem to think you crossed the Sierra and immediately hit Woodhouse's and that's not true. Next image, bush tits. Uh, the, uh, there's an interesting thing in the Owens Valley about Lone Pine. South of Lone Pine, they're like coastal birds. North of Lone Pine and east, all the way through the Great Basin, they have grayish crowns and pinkish ears. The these are the lead colored types, uh, plumbius. Um, if we look at a, here's a co more coastal bird with a brownish crown and a pale face. The lead colored types have a harder call note. And I know this in part, they're a little easier to hear because as I started losing my hearing, I could still hear lead colored bush tits and couldn't hear the coastal bush tits. So I knew their calls were different. Wax wings, cedar wax wings, you know, don't call anymore. Never mind. Next. <laughs> this is um, another issue. American pipit has two different uh, distinctive subspecies. One in, uh, in basic plumage, these heavily streaked birds with white wing bars, Japonicus, and they do get seen in North America. Uh, and then in breeding plumage, the Rocky Mountain subspecies, which also breeds in 
the Sierra and Mount San Gregorio Alticola is a rich unstreaked peach buff below. Next image. Well, Lance has done lots of great work on crossbills as of many others. Uh, correct me, Kimball, if I'm wrong, this is likely uh, Fraser Mountain in the Yellow Pines, so the type two. Uh, we split the cache across oh, bill. What did I, what's the type? They well, should, should be type two, but depending on what it sounded like. That's a pretty big bill. I have no idea. Larry photographed it, but the I didn't what vote for the splitting cache because there are Red Cross bills all over the world, the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, the Canary Islands. So there are probably 15 species. There's at least 11 or 12 types just within the US alone by call note types. They have different size bills that specialize on different pine cones. So someday, well, I don't have grandchildren, but their grandchildren, they'll probably sort it all out. The taxonomy's messed up. We're not talking, uh, that's Lance's talk. Onwards. 11 types, thanks Lance, in North America. Now I'm more interested in white wing crossbills because here there's just two. Uh, this is nominate leucopter, the North American bird with a fairly uh, narrow bill. And uh, I was looking at the color of them. I don't know if it's valid, but it's quite pink, our birds. Um, and then look at the bill size, the bill shape of the old world birds, bifasciata. Uh, and the color to me looks a little more reddish, less pinkish. Uh, I wondered if the wing bar shape was different, but I don't see anything apparent on this bird. Uh, this is the old world bird from Phenoscandia all the way to Kamchatka. Might have turned up on the Aleutians, but no specimen. But listening, if you go to the, listen to calls, to me, they sound very, very different. Uh, Leucopter, the North American birds turned up in Iceland, but Bifasciata is not yet known from North America. Uh, maybe Lance knows the paper that's already recommended a split uh, of these two uh, taxa. Next. And Lance has also studied the evening grosbeaks and is believe it's, is it four or five, I think five call note types? Um, yes, Lance is asking about Hispaniolan crossbill. And uh, that was considered a subspecies of white wing, uh, is now split as its own species. Um, but I'm thinking, and Kimball may correct me, that genetically it was closer to a red cross bill. Next image. I'm not, I'm not sure. Right. Myrtle and Audubon's warbler, that's got a, a big gripe from everybody. Uh, it, it's, it depends a little bit on what your species concept is, the uh, where they come together in rivers, lower rivers in British Columbia, uh, Northwest Alberta, there's complete hybridization. So that would mitigate against them being recognized as species, even though their call notes are different and morphologically, they look very different, uh, but you can't find uh, essentially no pure birds in the overlap zone. Those who would argue for splitting them would say, well, the hybrid zone is quite narrow and hasn't spread, would be the main argument. But for now, these are still the yellow rumped warbler. The next image. Now, this is the Goldman's warbler that's found, I guess, in Chiapas in one range. I didn't see it down there but primarily Guatemala. Uh, they get blacker as you go south into Mexico. And this is the blackest and the largest. Look at that white angled throat, uh, the sides of the throat, like a myrtle warbler. Apparently the songs are different, but I don't know if recordings exist. And I have been told that the males don't go into a basic plumage. They retain this plumage year round. Maybe I'm spreading a rumor. So Goldman's Warbler, uh, there's quite a move to split this, if, even if you don't split Myrtle and Audubon's. And it would almost be a Guatemalan endemic. Next image. Now here I threw this in 
This is the red-breasted sapsucker, the more southerly subspecies, Dagodai. And it and the next, sub, next bird species, I put species in quotation marks, the red-naped sapsucker, uh, where I live here on the east side of the Sierra, I see as many hybrids as I do red-naped. Uh, if you look at them carefully, they seem to, there's just nothing, there's a lot of intergradation, let me put it that way. And I'd consider this to be one of the weaker species on the North American checklist. Um, uh, Yellow-bellied, perhaps a little more different because they retain a longer, the juvenile plumage is retained for a long time. Now let's go to great white heron. Great white heron, there was a motion to split this recently. It failed. I voted for it. Um, they certainly do hybridize in, with great blues, the so-called Werdemann's heron in Florida Bay. But my more recent experience is Cuba. When you go out to the, um, the mangroves on the offshore keys and you see the great whites, and I've never seen a hybrid in Cuba. And the great blues you see routinely inland as well as migrants on the coast. And I've never seen a great white inland. So, and the Cuban ornithologists I've talked to, they've not seen integrates. So you, here you have both taxa uh, basically breeding on the same island, breeding in different habitats. Seems pretty convincing to me, but it did not pass. Uh, next. That's the same idea. I learned recently that, of course, the bill colors differ by age. So birding should always be, every time you go out, try to focus on learning something about, always look at your birds, what, what have I learned, and think about at the end of the, an outing, uh, how you may have, typically at my age, though, it's more, what have I forgotten, uh, which is kind of sad, but that's the way it is. I'd, we'd like to acknowledge uh, Larry for all of his wonderful images up there, up in the clouds somewhere. Uh, Dan Gibson, who's been a mentor and brilliant. We gave uh, the uh, Swarth Award to him. And there's the chair of the AOS committee, Terry Cheshire, who's offered advice and has had to deal with all of the fallout from the bird names for birds controversies. We thank Terry, he's still smiling. And uh, anything else? Uh, there's some references. Neil Smith, the McPherson's, uh, which I th wrote a wonderful paper on what was their eye in 61. And I think we're ready for an hour or so talk. Um, we're ready for questions, right, Kimball? Yeah, let's have somebody MC the Q&A. Yeah, well, um, I have the first question up um the first question is when there are two when there are co-chairs of the NACC I presume when there are co-chairs do both vote on changes well Carla votes Carla does a lot of the work in putting comments online and organizing that Terry organizes the batches and puts them together and writes the report so their tasks are a little different. And Terry usually defers from voting. I know that he was the definitive vote on accepting the red back strike from St. Lawrence Island. I found it a bit peculiar that he weighed in, but he did. He also voted, was the definitive vote on uh, thick-billed long spur rather than short grass long spur. Uh, so Sometimes if his guidance is needed and it, he, it's pretty much, he just decides to weigh in. Is that an answer, Ron? Yeah, it, it's really only just recently that Carla has been officially recognized on the website as a co-chair of the committee. So there isn't a long history of having two co-chairs on the committee, which makes it a little harder to answer the question. Yeah. Just for reference, Carla did all the work and wrote a long publication in book form of uh, resulted in the split of, um, remember the plain titmouse, well, oak and juniper titmouse now because of Carla's work. Mm, okay. And Sagebrush and uh, Bell Sparrow along with Ned Johnson, her mentor. Okay. Great. Tom Benson asks, 
when uh when will member when will member voting comments for the propose for this proposal uh regarding the uh, thick bill long spur be posted on the NACC website do you know that's a good question um i know the comments were massaged and edited for content that became a very very hot issue um and also the issue of the English name for what we now know as Maui Parrot Bill became a hot issue. Uh, so I will ask um, Terry that and uh, give an answer uh, in due course. Great. Both to Tom and, and others. Uh, Tom actually follows that up with, uh, what is the NACC's position on or approach to standardizing names at an international level, e.g. red phalarope versus gray phalarope? Also, why does the NACC not split green-winged and Eurasian teal? Um, the issue of international names, I know that uh, the IOC had a proposed list of English names, but it included things, for instance, the common loon in the old world, the Brits call it the great Northern diver. We call it the common loon. The IOC name was great Northern loon, a compromise name <laughs> that was viewed as a, as, as a non-starter. And, um, uh, I, I think there's a general sense within the NACC that we can live with our names, the Brits can live with their names. They typically <laughs> have not changed their names to accommodate uh, our names. So, you know, the Ran, the Swallow, maybe they went to Barn Swallow finally, but it, it seemed like we have enough problems to deal with than trying to hammer out, uh, well, Healthcare for all, Medicare for all, <laughs> bird names for all. Yeah, uh, we're currently mm -hmm. dealing with the eponymous name issue, uh, uh, which has been a pr pretty sensitive issue. And the second issue, the green wing teal. Right. I wrote a long dissent on splitting those. Uh, the motion came up. Uh, most most people in the old world do split them. Eurasian versus. Uh, Green wing teal is what they call American green wing. I can't remember even the English name. It's Kreka is the old world Kreka. Uh, Anna's Kreka versus uh, Carolinensis for ours. The study that was cited to split them was based on a quantitative, not a qualitative difference on birds in captivity in Europe on the number of head bobs was why that would affect mating, I have no idea. And also the genetic things they did were in Europe, uh, between Europe and North America, and didn't look at birds in the Aleutians or Western Alaska, where they come much closer together. And the genetic situation was much, um, much less clear. And also the male calls are, there's no difference between the call notes most of the puddle ducks have the males have distinctive call notes, but American green wing and Eurasian teal to everyone's ears have identical call notes. And those in the Aleutians uh, see hybrids pretty routinely in good numbers, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, let me just add that question that Tom raises a much larger issue that we're not really going to talk much about, which is the idea of all these different global checklists um, differing from AOE, AOS and so on, is there an effort to really try to merge all of these and come up with one accepted standardized world list that everybody would be happy with? And of course, the answer is no, there'll never be one that everybody's happy with. But the IOC, uh, they, have, they certainly have an initiative and they're talking with all the other entities, including the you know, the, the Dickinson and the, the Howard and Moore list, Clements, uh, the AOS and so on, about at least striving toward that ultimate goal of, of agreeing and merging 
checklists as much as possible. So there's one unified world list, but it hasn't happened yet. And it's not going to happen very easily, I don't think. And of course, English names is going to be one of the one of the many stumbling blocks. It, it ought to be easier, you would think, to come up with the, the actual species level and, and, and ordinal and family level um, taxonomies and agree with those, but coming up with standard English names is going to be controversial, I think, no matter what. And in fact, I don't even know if there is a gray phalarope, the way Tom spelled it, G-R-A-Y, because I thought they spelled it G-R-E-Y. So maybe you coined yet a new, another new name. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when we got into that, the if you just Google, you know, how, how spellings like gray, G-R-E-Y, G-R-A-Y, when those diverged, and it was uh, one of the Websters in the 1830s, 1840s that really wanted American English. <coughs> it, it had only been a decade or two earlier that, you know, we're fighting in New Orleans and had disagreements up in the Great Lakes, and we wanted our own brand of English. So Sabre, but Sabre didn't get changed till the, when Custer went down, we, they spelled Sabre like they do in Britain, but it got changed. And uh, at about 1910, so there's a motion to change, you know, saber wings. Do we go to the American spelling? Uh, <laughs> it's endless. May I recommend on English names, always look at the scientific name it is far more revealing than the long argument about the English names. And I just wanted to also just go back quickly and mention between the SACC and the NACC, you have taxonomic bodies that basically determine taxonomy for the entire Western hemisphere. And that just doesn't exist now, really hardly at all in the old world. Uh, even the BOU that handled all of that uh, doesn't really handle taxonomy. So um, I don't mean you can, can still complain about us, but at least their bodies that are dealing with these matters, uh, maybe all the whining, complaining, they just gave up. Everybody, <laughs> their own taxonomy in the old world. Hmm. Um, we're en entering into questions that I'm not sure I understand when I ask them, so feel free to correct me. Uh, <laughs> Laura Laura asks, has anyone tried to introduce a motion to set a certain p-value of matching genetic material to determine to determine is considered a species and what isn't. Um, have there been many studies addressing this problem? Well, let me, Lara, let me try to tackle that. I think more broadly, what you're asking is: there, is there a certain amount of genetic divergence? that would enable one to say these should be recognized as species, whereas if the divergence is less, then no, we would just consider them all the same species or maybe subspecies, um, or going on up the hierarchy, you know, greater amount of divergence, yes, they should be in their own family or whatever. Um, I would say that this guides taxonomic decisions. For example, if there's like, you know, 5% uh, base pair difference in genetics, the sequence is looked at, that's a fair amount for the species level. Um, so that might guide the decision, but no, I think most of the practicing taxonomists don't like to have a absolute amount of genetic similarity or difference that says whether or not it is a good species or not. So um, there are probably other taxonomists who would like to be um, a little more consistent there about the amount of difference, but you know, it, it again, it kind of departs depends on what part of the genome you're looking at, how you measure it, how you do all the statistics, and so on. So I would say no, uh, nobody's trying to come up with this certain value that would say yes, it's a species, or no, that it's not. But genetic distance or difference is certainly one of the factors that would guide those decisions. Well. And I would I'm sorry add one if of, that didn't really answer you. One of the figures, numbers I heard was 3%. I can't remember, to be honest, if it was 3 or 4%. So under that, if it was 1 or 2%, particularly 1% or less, 
that's sort of a warning sign that maybe they're not separate species. But once you get over three or four percent, then it, it's pretty distinct differences. Um, look, they, that's hard to remember. I was read before the election, Nate Silver's 538, and he talked about the Republicans' inherent advantage in the Electoral College. And he said if uh, Biden didn't win by more than 3%, that the odds favored he would lose the Electoral College vote. And so I kept looking at that popular vote thinking, hmm, 3%. So maybe that's, I'm not sure it's the same as bird taxonomy, but it's something somewhere around there uh, as a percent. But one thing we didn't mention and probably should, the ideal situation is, you know, the, the three terms uh, sympatric, allopatric, parapatric. Uh, sympatric is the ideal situation where you have both considered uh, taxa that occur in the same place and you can see what they do. Do they hybridize? There's nothing but hybrids. Or do they show that they, um, what's the, uh, symmetrically, is that the right word? Uh, mate with, each, with their own kind. Um, and is now yeah, allopatric is hard because they, they're populations that don't, they're, not, they're separate. And so they don't really occur together. Um, then then it, you just have to sort of use everything else to think, well, what would they do if they came together? Uh, Parapatric, they occur right up next to each other. So that's pretty revealing. Um, so those, those are some of the considerations, I think. If it, one of the arguments for lumping the red poles, they were not genetically very different, hardly at all. And yet alone, the hoary and common red poles, nobody's really done a study on the breeding grounds to see what the red poles do. And there are discussions that maybe the Darwin's finches, the genetic difference is very slight between the various finches. So that it's not the be all end all, just look at a certain percent. Uh, Carla told me once that the Stellar's Jays, where the white fronted and blue fronted approach each other, the genetic difference was 7%, uh, Macrolofa versus the, you know, the Stellar Eye group. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it's endless, these things. So we've learned from John that Donald Trump and Joe Biden are different species. Did I understand that correctly? <laughs> Well, the amount of the, divergence. The um, GOP there, favors, there are some questions. The Electoral College favors the GOP by 3%, according to Nate Silver. Yes, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions that are getting into weeds that I, I can't navigate very well about the, exactly what is meant on this percent divergence. Is it per some unit of evolutionary time or is it? I mean, I think what I've been thinking of is simply base pair differences or divergence in the genetic sequences, but um, certainly you'd want to factor in, you know, what's known about divergence time as well. And divergence time is often used as sort of a metric of whether this is a, you know, a good family level or generic level distinction um, to try to keep these divergence times sort of, um, similar to one another at a given taxonomic hierarchy level. But again, this is beyond my uh, pay grade here. I was not put on the NACC for my genetic skills, which is another way of saying it's best I shut up on those questions. Well, but you, you were talking about Jays and Lance did ask uh, about splits among Canada Jays. Well, you have multiple subspecies that certainly differ pretty strongly morphologically. I don't know about vocalizations or genetic studies on that. I, I haven't seen a motion. Mainly, we just wanted to celebrate Canada, go back to an earlier name. Hence, uh, we no longer have to worry with to spell it G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y. Um, Ken Ely, who's over on the live stream, asks a really interesting question. Uh, with the current progress with genetic work, I could, I could not tell if the field work that led to the yellow round dwarf split, I presume, 
for example, is still important? And I think it's a great question. Um, how relevant is field work now that we have such good genetic study? But they're but the yellow rumps are sympatric. So what do the birds do? And if they get together and there's nothing but hybrids, at least under the BSC concept, that's a pretty good indication why I split them. But the, the vote was sharply divided. At that time, the committee was 10 and the vote was five to five. So there was a strong divergence of opinions. Most votes within the committee are very strong one way or the, the other. And it's only occasional, occasionally that you get a, a, a very close vote. So there is a, a question related to that by an anonymous attendee that says, what do you do with birds that can hybridize and produce fertile offspring with another bird species? That goes against the biological species concept, right? And actually, no, it doesn't, at least not the way biological species concept is interpreted these days. Hybridization occurs, it happens. Um, we, we all grew up being taught that if, if two species can hybridize, then if two parental forms, then they're the same species. But that's, that's and produce fertile offspring. But it's, you know, it's simply, it's much messier than that. So really what's looked for, as we talked about, is the extent of hybrid, hybridization, the size and width of hybrid zones, the consistency of hybrid zones, does it move, does it grow, and so on. So hybridization is very much allowed by the biological species concept, um, but the degree to it and the geographical shape of it and what it means genetically in terms of mixture all factor in in species decisions. Uh, Kimball, would you mind going to, uh, taking the David Koppel uh, question also? I'm not sure um, if that's a typo or, or something I don't recognize. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, Dave, exactly what you meant, a reliance on pattern cladistics among evolutionary biologists in recent decades have any influence on taxonomic decisions among ornithologists. Um, you know, cladistics is something of a sort of a taxonomic religion. Um, it really comes into play mostly in dealing with fossil forms and interpreting the fossil record. So how you analyze characters and, and classify or code characters as being, you know, what we've always learned is primitive or derived and, and so on. Um, I would say it doesn't play much of a role. It had no role in the big the big lump of 1973, but I think, Dave, I'd have to chat with you separately about that to understand more what you're asking. And do you want to take Lance's question there? John, you can do that on the Haida Gwaii Sawwet Owl. That was a proposal, right? Right. Is this on me? Let me hit the Q and A, and I can hopefully see. Yes, the Heidi Gwai, That was a motion last year, and um, I I will proudly say I was the sole member of the checklist committee to vote for that split, and the reasons I did that was. Um, well, one, there are no hybrid specimens. Heidi Gwai used to be known as the Queen Charlotte Islands. Uh, Heidi Gwai is the native name. Um, the, and it's, the, it's Brookside that breeds there. And it's illustrated in the latest edition of the Geographic Guide and Sibley. It's uh, quite a bit more cinnamon colored underneath. Um, there are records of what is it, Acadicus, nominate Acadicus. I think I have the specific epithet right. Presumably winter birds from the mainland. There are no hybrids that they have a pretty distinctive biology. Uh, most of the specimens are road kills, vehicles traveling near the coast. There's some thought that it feeds on marine life and the tidal zone. Um, their calls are apparently pretty similar, maybe slight differences. But my main, the main reason, I, this is sort of like the ducks issue that. Um, I spent an hour listening to an unspotted sawwood owl 
call notes and the tooting male song. And I couldn't hear one iota of difference between Unspotted Sawwood Owl and Northern Sawwood Owl. Uh, Unspotted Sawwood Owl is the Middle American uh, currently recognized as a separate species. So I thought, well, if you're not going to split Brook's eye, then you might as well lump Unspotted Sawwood Owl in with Northern Sawwood. Um, but my view did not prevail. Hmm. There's a question in the chat. Um, I guess we've used the term clade. Can you clarify what is meant by that? Um, how, how and why is it used? So clade, essentially we're just referring to a group of taxa, whether it's species or whatever level that are more closely related to each other than to any other. So, you know, for example, where you've got a phylogenetic tree and there's a, a node or a split, it splits into two clades to basically separate evolutionary units. So that, that's all it's meant. There's a, there's a lot of jargon in taxonomy and we apologize if we've thrown some of it out without adequately defining it. So let me just show you something I referred. Can you see that in uh, the ornithologist dictionary? Is that showing? Yep. And so I yeah, it's got a penguin on it. It does. The lead author is uh, Eretz Zo. Uh, multiple authors, including Kevin Winker, who's on the uh, AOS committee. But I use this all the time. It's available through Budio Books, just like a pocket dictionary. Their definition of clade, a group of species, including all descendants from a common ancestor, and therefore constituting a monophyletic group. Now, there are probably alternative definitions, but uh, when I come across terms, which is often, this is the first thing I go to, it sits on my desk. It's pretty, it's by links, is the publisher. And uh, Ken Ely over on Livestream uh, followed up with a question. Uh, from an answer to a previous to, to a previous question, it seems genetic work progress does not supplant field work, but is another factor to consider. Is that a correct interpretation? Yes. Yes. <laughs> First um, of all, you don't have genetic information if you don't have field work, because you've got to get the genetic samples somehow. But but more to his more to the, the point. Yeah, the, the genetic studies answer some things and field work answers other things about the biological situations that are involved. So I'd say they're both very important. I, it's uh, relevant a bit on this. Sometimes the people that just do genetic work know nothing about the birds themselves. And if you know the birds themselves, the genetic work is can be a, an excellent tool in helping to elucidate what you have already learned from the field. So there are two genetic studies using mitochondrial DNA on the uh, blue grosbeak, looking at blue grosbeak, and they determined that the sister species was largely bunting. Uh, now, at that time, blue grosbeak was in its own genus, Guerica. Um, we didn't really argue that it didn't belong in Passerina, but I thought, Oh, give me a break. Lazuli and indigo buntings, which sound identical, look very similar, and uh, non-adult male plumages uh, are surely each other's sister species. And sure enough, when they looked at nuclear DNA, that uh, it showed that indeed lazuli and indigo bunting were sister species. Big shock. So you sometimes <laughs> would think if you come out with a result that looks pretty suspect, maybe used use alternative ways of checking results. So field work's very important. Fantastic. Well, before I thank uh, John Dunn and Kimball Garrett for us, um, I want to ask John, what are our five North American tanagers? Ah, <laughs> did you get the answers from folks? Uh, no, I haven't seen any chat. But uh, does a white collar seed eater fit in there somewhere? Well, that's the former name. Oh, so, okay. 
Orlais, the French, I think he was a, an ornithologist in Mexico and they named it after him, but misspelled his last name. I miss Tom's, uh, I saw Tom flash something up. Ah, uh, yeah, Tom got, Yeah, so Morale Seed Eater is one. The, the misspelling stays, um, the misspelling stays. I see another, uh, so let's, let's do the, yeah, Curtis. Curtis. <laughs> there we go. Everybody's, let's deal with the ones that are called tanagers that aren't. So scarlet tanager and summer tanager and a paddock tanager and western tanager and flame colored tanager, uh, as, as well as uh, one in uh, a couple in Mexico, in addition, uh, that one in the Yucatan and uh, white winged and red headed. There's some questions whether they belong in, but they're currently all in Paranga. So we, we call them Scarlet Paranga and Western Paranga. And that's when Van Remsen said I would be killed um, by the birding public. So that, that was a trial balloon that didn't go anywhere. So the five, uh, I think Curtis got them. They're all rare to casual. So uh, red-legged honeycreeper is one. That's been recorded uh, a few times in South Florida. The origin's been questioned, but they're uh, introduced and established on uh, Cuba. Uh, the Morale seed eater, the Sharpie eye subspecies, which breeds locally on the Rio Grande, not near the mouth, but upriver, um, Webb, Zapata counties. Um, and then um, the two grass quits, black faced from. Um, which gets to, is basically from the probably come from the Bahamas to Florida and the yellow faced uh, two subspecies have been recorded as strays one to Florida the other Wallavasia and uh, nominate to South Texas and then that leaves I think it was in Cetus for many years but now it's been moved to the Tanagers the banana quit which is in the Bahamas so those are the five that are so Two people put Western Spindalis. So Spindalis is actually in it's a, in the own in family. family. Spindality, monotypic, which which was another uh, well, not monotypic. Uh, the, no, but, but there are five. What four species? Well, right, there five. Right, but it's a well, there five, only five. the one genus. In right, Spindal Spindalis, and that was a case where that was formerly known as the striped-headed tanager. And it happily, we put it in the genus, Spindalis. So Western Spindalis, which has five subspecies. And then the ones on, uh, there's one in Jamaica, one in Hispaniola, and one in Puerto Rico. Four, four, four species in that genus. And everybody was happy to call it a Spindalis. But my God, when you get to the Scarlet Tanager, how could you consider Scarlet Paranga? That's a heresy. <laughs> if it, but if I'd been in Salem and proposed that, bad things could have happened in 1691. <laughs> um, we did have one more question pop up. Uh, what prompted the placement of the osprey in its own family? Pandionidae. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. One of those higher level changes. Kimball, you weren't on the Evolution did it. I'm fast. Um, that's gone back and forth for a long, long time. I mean, Osprey certainly has some very special morphological specializations that are quite different from the other exhibit reformies. I assume they're genetically quite distinct, but I, I don't know when that actual decision was made and what the reasoning was. I will comment briefly on Osprey. I'm very interested, as are others in the Caribbean osprey ridgeway eye with a white head and a much paler underwing. And structurally, it looks much broader winged and has enormous feet. Um, and as opposed to our osprey, uh, is it Carolinensis, I think, um, which is much more highly, more highly migratory. Um, 
anyway, a potential split possibly. Fantastic. And Ridgeway I has made it into South Florida. Cool. Keys. Well, with that, I wanted to thank both uh, John Dunn and Kimball Garrett for this wonderful talk tonight. Um, we, uh, it, it really was a wonderful talk. If you missed some of it or want to go back and study some more on it, we will, it was recorded and will be put onto our website uh, probably by tomorrow, if not sooner. Also, I want to tell you about what's coming up next week. Kimmel Garrett, with the assistance of some great artwork from Andrew Birch, will be uh, uh, getting us started on our first community science project, uh, the Great Sage Sparrow Hunt through uh, Antelope Valley. So we're all looking forward to that. It's next week at 7 o'clock. If you're on our... Um, on our list, you will receive a notice shortly. If uh, you can always go to our live stream at, on our website at labirders.org and click on the uh, on the live stream link. And uh, Kimball and John, is there anything else that yeah. you would like can to I, say? Be yeah, sure. Um, I, there, I'm sure there are additional questions that came in, but because of the hour. We didn't get to them. And honestly, you know, if I'd picked all the things I wanted to talk about, it would have been a, a five week program of all the things we've encountered. So, and many of you may have thought of additional things you'd wish you'd asked. Is there a way that people could send you questions um, over the course of the next few weeks? And then maybe perhaps, Kimmel and myself could tackle them and then you could post them in some manner that everybody could read our answers to additional questions. Or am I thinking too far outside the box? <laughs> I'll be told like Van Remsen when I suggested Scarlet Paranga that my death was soon to come. <laughs> Mark, I think that, that uh, could you, work. I think you need to take this, go ahead. Yes, no, that could work. So we, we have a uh, contact us form on the, uh, on the website. And if you, you can put your questions there, fill them out, we can um, forward those to John and Kimball and we can put the answers, uh, the questions and the answers um, perhaps on the same, you know, underneath this webinar inside of the, uh, the webinar page. Yeah, so we, we, would would we would appreciate corrections too. I know on some of the genetic questions, you know, I sort of felt like I was, heading out on ice that the temperature was 31.8 degrees that, <laughs> so I, I, it's we could have um i don't know politely put it messed up uh with some of our answers it's it's a pretty uh, esoteric issue and uh some of the things we only touched on and i'm sure probably created more confusion rather than clarity but hopefully we covered a kind of the broad spectrum the history of the organization trying to get more women on the committee, as well as being more broadly representative. Uh, but then of course we have to deal with the um, English names and eponyms and there's there's plenty of potholes along the way. Uh, Pacific Ran is an English name. I cannot say it was one of the more popular decisions and often these, but anyway, see, I'm already wandering on. Everybody, <laughs> uh, I'm beginning on to rant. But um, yeah, but we'll be glad to. So if you uh, click the contact us button on our website at laburgers.org, we will uh, forward the questions to Kimball and John and put both the questions and answers on our website under this webinar uh, link, under this webinar post, I mean, and that would be wonderful. Next Tuesday night at seven o'clock, don't forget our great sagebrush sparrow hunt um uh class i guess webinar to get started on that and mark is there anything else i'm missing there's nothing else you're missing uh, other than thanking john and kimball again and frank and susan for uh helping uh them uh you know set up and and build the presentation absolutely i also wanted to thank mark and janet shield mark shield on the front end janet shield on the back end helping us uh, 
transfer over those questions from the live stream and Mark uh, helping set up this uh, the whole webinar. And with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see everyone next week. Take care. Who comes up with your jokes? Oh. <laughs> <laughs>